Right, this week's Torah portion is Shalach Lecha. Um, and what we're going to see this week and next week is this central theme of rebellion and walking according to your own desires, shirking authority and doing things how I want to do this my way, when I want it, how I want it. We're going to see this today and next week. We're also going to see today lack of trust, lack of faith. And what does that actually mean and what does it, how does it manifest? So let's just jump in. Numbers 13, Bimidbar 13. And Diyar spoke to Moshe, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Send one man from each tribe of their fathers, everyone a leader among them. This is send men, well, just send, is shlech lecha. And as we're going to see, it's a bit of a poor translation. The King James picks this up better, saying, send for yourselves. And this is, it will be key. And by the command of Yah, Moshe sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all of the men who were the heads of children of Israel. Now, the parallel passage to this actually gives us a slightly different angle. We read this in Deuteronomy. And all of you came near to me and said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go and of the cities into which we would come. It was actually, this says it was the people's idea. And the matter was good in my eyes, so I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe. It would seem it was actually the people's idea to send men to search out the land. They wanted, when we have the unknown in front of us, we like to put feelers out, don't we? So let's see what is round the corner. It wouldn't be much of a stretch to assume that Moshe went, then went to Elohim to ask him of the matter. These men have come before to me and said, we want to seek out the land. He's not just going to do it without inquiring, which is where I believe we then come to this, where Yah says, send for yourself. Now, in the scriptures version, it just says send men. The Hebrew, here, this one, shalach lecha, it means send for yourself. There's implied disapproval. If you catch, like, send, do it, just do it. Send, do it for yourself. Just because Elohim allows it does not necessarily mean it's his will. This is something I had to learn, that just because he's allowed something doesn't mean it's the way he would have preferred it to go. As an aside, the same applies to prophecy. A lot of people say prophecy is Yah's will. It's not. It's telling you, he, that's him telling you how things are going to occur. You know, it says that Yah does not wish anyone to perish, but that they all repent. Now it's prophesied that that's not going to happen. Prophecy tells you what's going to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean it's his will is going to happen, though. Just for what it's worth. I believe that what is implied in the Hebrew is that there's this disapproval. It's like, you know what? You've got lack of faith, but do it anyway. Send for yourselves. The word to, for spy out is tour, and it implies more of a seeking out and a touring and exploring, not let's go and gather. It, it, it's just to see what it is, like a tourist would go. Moshe's idea, I believe, was more of sending the 12 spies to confirm what Elohim had already said about the land. Elohim had said, I'm going to send you to a land that's fruitful, you know, with milk and honey, a land that brings forth abundance. And I believe that Moshe would have probably thinking, you know what, let's give the people something. They've, you know, they've really struggled. Let's give them, you know, give them an inch, so to speak. However, they turned the mission into one of military assessment. Moshe's idea was, you know what, let's go confirm Yah's word that the land is what he says it is for the people. But they turned it into a military reconnaissance mission. This was not actually necessary in light of what Elohim had said previously. In Exodus 23, Elohim says, See, I am sending a messenger before you to guard you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on guard before him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he's not going to pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. 
But if you diligently obey his voice and shall do all that I speak, then I shall be an enemy to your enemies and a distresser to those who distress you. For my messenger shall go before you and shall bring you into the land of the Amorites and so forth, and I shall cut them off. Yah had already promised victory. So them turning it into a military reconnaissance mission was actually showing doubt, showing lack of faith, distrust. And that, that's rebellion. That's one of the ways it manifests. Distrust will manifest itself into rebellion eventually, as we will see. What Moshe intended for good ended up being the downfall of a whole generation. We know the story, right? They all, they're all wiped out in the desert over 40 years. Elohim's will must be sought out at all costs. That's the point I'm trying to say. Seek his will, seek his will, and if he's being quiet, don't act presumptuously because you're not getting an answer. Sometimes patience is the key. You know, <laughs> there's been times I've, uh, I've prayed and fasted, and I've, not had the, I've come to the end of my fast, and I've not had an answer. And I've gone, what's going on? What's going on? And I've not had the answer till like weeks later. I'm like, ah, oh, finally. But again, seek out his will. Again, just because he's allowed it doesn't mean it was his in, in, intention. Verse 4 to 15 goes on to list the 12 spies by their tribes, their personal names, and their respective fathers. When we put all the meanings of the names together, we see this wonderful story play out, a bit like with the uh, 12 patriarchs. We get the same thing with the spies. So note that the name of the tribes are not in birth order. When you read the passage, it gives you the tribe name, then the person, then whose father's house they're from. So this is how it appears in the text. You can look at it for yourself. Behold a son. These are the meanings of the tribe names. And when you put them in the order given, you get this. Now, let's take these meanings and string them together in like a sentence. Behold a son, hear him, give him praise, for he brings reward, and you will be doubly blessed. He is the son of my right hand, and he will dwell with us. He will cause you to forget your troubles when he returns as a judge. Happy and blessed are those who believe, though we will have strife in the world, he is our fortune and wealth. Again, that's from these. And you can, depending how you read it, you might get, I, I found I had something slightly different down the bottom. But it's just amazing. It's really neat. Something similar occurs when we put the name meanings of the spies together. So that was the tribal names. Let's look at the spies. Here, to judge, like the heart. He redeems, salvation, my deliverer. El is my good fortune, and so forth. Let's string that into a sentence. Hear him, for he will judge the heart. He will redeem me with salvation, for he is my deliverer. My El is surely my good fortune. The El of my people has been concealed. Though he is hidden, he will be magnified and exalted. That reminded me, there's a verse that says, I was hidden in the scroll of the book in Isaiah. And I believe it's a clear messianic prophecy. Anyway, just a nice little intro. You know, when we read these lists of names, we think, oh, it's just names. There's stuff in there. These are the names of the men who Moshe sent out to spy the land. And Moshe called Hoshea, son of Nun, Yehoshua. So this is Hoshea, Yehoshua. By adding the letter Yud, the little flick, the name changes from salvation or deliverer to Yah saves or Yah delivers. Now, the ancient sages, they teach that Moshe basically anticipated trouble when he sent out the spies and that it would be Hosea, Hoshea, that would save them. And he was reminding Joshua where his strength really came from. This whole thing of remember you're a man, remember where your strength comes from. Again, there's this whole thing of changing of character, like when Jacob had his name changed, he, he, he took his destiny, came with it. I believe the same happened here with Hoshea, who then became Yehoshua. It's actually interesting in light of what Yehoshua does later. I mean, he's one of the two, you know, Caleb and Joshua stands up and goes, let's take the land. He was trying to save the people. And also, obviously, that he's the type and shadow of Messiah. 
And Moshe sent them out to, the land, to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up here into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like and the people who dwell in it, whether strong or weak, whether few or many, and whether the land they dwell in is good or evil, whether the cities they inhabit are in camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. You shall be strong, and you shall be strong, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time of the season was the first fruits of grapes. So we're nearing the time of Sukkot, actually, in this instance. It's in that period between Shavuot, well, the period we're in, but maybe a bit later. Whether there are forests or not, the Hebrew is interested in there. The word for forest there is actually etz, which means tree. And in this instance, it's actually in singular. It's not trees. It would read better, and if there is a tree there or not. Now, because of this, some of the ancient sages used to teach that Moshe was asking them to see if the tree of life was there or not. Interesting. I just find it's interesting because uh, the word trees uh, in plural is etzim. And it literally says if there is a tree in it or not. Could this be part of the reason why the spies gave a bad report? Um, it's just interesting conjecture. I'm not saying this is doctrine. It's interesting to you know, think about these things. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Sin as far as Rehov, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron. And Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the, des- the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebron had been built seven years before Tsoan in Mitzrayim. And they came out to the Wadi Eshchol and to cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bore it between the two of them on a pole, also of the pomegranates and of the figs. So this is the, this is the journey they would have made from Kadesh Barnea all the way up, then up this way, right the way up to Rehob. Now what this looks like is this. They've literally done that whole section here. And then they came all the way back. And that took them 40 days. Um, and it says they carried the grapes on a pole. So it would have been this big thing. It really, truly was a land that gave good fruit and bounty. And they went and came to Moshe and Aharon and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they reported to him and said, we went to the land where you sent us, and truly it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. But the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are walled, very great, and we saw the descendants of Anak there too. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, while the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Yardain. Now, is there anything wrong up until this point in what they've said? No, they're just stating facts. They're not doing it. Up until this point, the spies have not actually lied or said anything bad at all. They've said, this is what, here's the fruit, it's brilliant, but, you know, there's a few scary people there. It's after this that it starts to turn. Obviously, the people get distressed because of this. And Caleb, Kalev, silenced the people before Moshe and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are certainly able to overcome it. You know, when Yah sends a, a, a trial or allows you to go through something, sometimes we go, oh, there's giants there, and it's not comfortable. Do we have the heart of Kalev to go, Elohim is my keeper, Elohim will take me through this. But now we start to get the... The turning around. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. This is where it goes all pear shaped. The phrase stronger than we can also be translated as stronger than him. If you look at the Hebrew, it's this, it says uh, at the end, it says, Hu mi menu, which means strong, like, stronger than him from us. It can be rendered both ways. Think about this. They're saying he, they are stronger than Elohim. I mean, what did they do every single time they tried Elohim? They doubted. Doubt. 
If you don't believe it, let's keep going. And they gave the children of Israel an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land eating up its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. The phrase for evil report is actually slanderous report. They they were slandering the land and what Elohim had provided for them. This is how, why I believe there's this thing as well, of they're stronger than him. You don't, you don't see it in the translation. This is the word, debar, slander, whispering, defamation, defaming, an evil report. That there were, it's this whole, oh, go on, can, they were whispering, doubting, defaming. This is a character assassination, Lashon Hara, slander. Evil speech. It's like Elohim said, I've given you this, and they've they've essentially spat on it. The ten spies were slandering Elohim by the report they gave. They essentially made him out to be a liar. Because didn't he say, he, he doesn't say if you come into the land, he says when you come into the land. I will do this for you, and I will deliver you. And they're saying, nah. You can't do that. They're stronger. They're too much slandering him and making him out to be a liar. And we saw there the Nephilim, the sons of Anak and the Neph- of the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes and so we were in their eyes. This is what they could have looked like. So Og of Bashan, we read of Og of Bashan and it gives you the measurements of his bed. And from that, we get, where's my mouse? We get this guy here from the measurements. This is Goliath scale. Now, in Amos 2, it says that uh, the sons of uh, Anak got as high as the cedar trees. And this is the height of a small cedar tree. So these are just smaller computations. I mean, even if this is not correct, let's just say this guy. This was Og of Bashan. We know that they defeated Og. Imagine being stood there. Because we think of people just stretched out. Like, you've got to think, everything would have gone up. These guys were warriors. You know, like, they trained. They they would have been warriors. They they would have held weapons. They weren't weak people. They were strong. This is another demonstration of it. On the higher side, when they got as tall as cedar trees. Now... To some degree, the Israelites actually had a reason to fear. They actually had an excuse. (laughs) The point I'm trying to make is that we don't have that excuse. We we don't see, yes, we don't have the glory and stuff there in front of us, the physical manifest, but we don't have this to contend with. So when we're like, oh, my life, the, the troubles are too big. Like, really? These guys had real reason to fear. And depending, if you believe that these were like, you know, Nephilim, I don't want to get into that, but, you know, occultism and all that, they had real reason to fear. Yet, this is all I actually hear from the body nowadays. Oh, the Nephilim. What's the majority of the people, like, talking about now? The Nephilim. The Nephilim are coming back, genetic mutations, transhumanism, ah! The Illuminati, they're running the world, the secret cabal of everything, the secret 13 bloodlines, ah, fear, fear. The Jesuits, the, just keep going on. People talk about all these things. Now, look, I'm not denying these things. I agree, these things are there. They're there. I'm not denying it, but people are too focused on these things. And they, because of it, they, they fear it. It, 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 it not, not only does it distract you from the path you're trying to be walking on, if you stay there, but th- then you end up living in fear, not wanting to move forward, or you give up. Well, what's the point? What's the point? Because they're running the show anyway. Are we doing the same thing that these Israelites did? Oh, well, the Nephilim. They're too big, they're too strong. What's the point? Let's turn around. Why are people not talking about their walk, their sanctification? Let's focus on that. How about our heart circumcision? Developing the character of Yeshua. Their character development. 
You know, I don't, I don't see people getting really excited. Man, you know what? I overcame this thing. I overcame my anger. Let's focus on that. Let's help other people overcome. They're becoming more and more like Yeshua. I don't see people getting as excited for that as I do all the other stuff. And when they... It's good to know these things. Look, it was the topic of the Nephilim that kind of, it led me to the feasts. If it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have had the feast and so forth. For some people, it was flat earth. Just pick a topic. These things, but we didn't stay there. The problem is people staying in these places, staying in the fringes. You're not moving closer and closer to the center of holiness. Why am I not hearing this? Get, people are getting excited about that. Because people focus on the Nephilim, enter anything. It can be the Nephilim, it can be anything. They live in fear. It stops them from actually living out their life as normal. I've seen this. Do we trust Yah when he says, oh, you will inherit the land? That fear slanders the most high, like it did earlier. They, you bring a slanderous report of the land that he's quote-unquote giving you. By your fear, you slander him. You're saying he can't overcome. When you have a giant or a mountain of troubles in front of you, your lack of trust slanders him. And I, look, I'm not saying... When you face these giants, it's normal to be like, okay, this is difficult and it's a bit scary. That's fine. But what do you do with that? Do you, do you go, okay, Father, it's in your hands. Let's do this. Though I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. You know, David truly, he feared. Yeshua feared. On, when he was weeping, get me, Father, let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to drink it, but your will be done. Do we have that attitude? It's okay to fear, but are we then going to use that fear to, to slander him? Does that make sense? We're human. When Yeshua came, he came human. He feared, he, he cried, he wept, he loved Jesus, but he, he carried on, focused. When this fear and lack of trust goes unchecked, this is the fruit that it begins to bear. Let's keep going. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. Oh, woe is me. We're screwed. We're all going to die. And all the children of Israel grumbled against Moshe and against Aharon, and all the congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Mitzrayim, or if only we had died in this wilderness. The equivalent nowadays is saying, if only we had died in our trespasses. Paul says, you were dead in trespasses, but you've been raised up. That's the equivalent. I wish I died without, when things was easy. And why is, Yah bring, why is Yah bringing us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become a prey? Would it not be better for us to turn back to Mitzrayim, to Egypt? Again, that's the equivalent of saying, this walk is too difficult, I'm going back to the world. And we know what it says, we're going to cover this in part two, of those that you can't have tasted of the full glory and then turn back and be renewed unto repentance. And they said to each other, let us appoint a leader and let us turn back to Mitzrayim. It reminded me of this. In the sight of Elohim and the master Yeshua Messiah, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and in his reign, I earnestly charge you, proclaim the word. Be urgent in season, out of season. Reprove, warn, appeal with all patience. So that we, we forget that bit, don't we? And teaching. For there shall be a time when they shall not bear sound teaching, but according to their own desires they shall heap up for themselves teachers tickling the ear, and they shall indeed turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to myths. This is what happens. They fear, they don't want, they don't want to put the work in of ploughing and tilling the ground of their lives. So they go, let's, you know what, let's appoint ourselves a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moshe, uh, this is amazing, then Moshe and Aharon fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. 
And Yehoshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Yephunneh, who were among those who had spied out of the land, they tore their garments, and they spoke to all the congregation of Yisrael, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If Yah has delighted in us, then he shall bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which is flowing with milk and honey. I love this. The whole congregation has turned against them. Millions of people, and they're still pleading with them. I mean, literally down to the wire. Only, only do not rebel against Yah, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their defense has turned away from them. Yah is with us. Do not, they're literally saying that they're slim pickings. Let's just do this. And I, what I love about this is the courage these people show to stand up to millions of people. Four people there, Moshe, Aharon, Caleb and Joshua. And I see an awful lot of congregational leaders. They can't even stand up to their congregation when they can clearly see it's going off to the left or off to the right. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the esteem of Yah appeared in the tent of meeting before the children of Yisrael. The people turned on their own leaders for them simply telling the truth and trying to turn them back to Elohim. It's a leader's job to call it out for what it is, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Okay, we know that our hearts are likened unto land. We've done this before. Parable of the sower. You, should, you know, the ground of the heart. In Jeremiah it says, circumcise your hearts unto Yah and, and break up your tillable ground. What giants do we have to dispossess in our land? You know, let, let's name the big ones. Sexual immorality, lust, lack of faith, lack of trust, anger. How do we react when we see them? You know, there have been times in my life when I've said, yeah, I cannot do this. It's too difficult. It's too difficult. I can't overcome this. Truth is, you probably can't. But what, did, what was your promise to them? My messenger shall go forth before you. Listen to him and he will be... The, do you see what I mean? We have that... It's, this, is, this was Yeshua, the messenger of Yah. Do we claim to have Yeshua? Are we going to face our giants? Allowing these giants to live is to disobey Elohim's command. To say, you know what? It doesn't matter. You disobeyed his command. Because he, he, when, he, when the children of Israel went into the land, he didn't say, I'll just move in and make covenants with them. He said, no, you're going to wipe them all out. Down to the last one. Do we use our sinful and fallen nature to justify allowing our sinful desires to live? They're too difficult. I can't do this. I'm just going to put a barricade there and leave them there. I hope people can see the parallels between this incident of the spies going into the land and the people failing in this and how this applies to us. Are we going to be like Caleb and Joshua and go, Yah's with us? Do we turn against our leaders when they try and help us with facing our giants? Because that's what these people did. The leader says, look, Yah's with us. And they turned on him and then wanted to appoint their own leaders. You know, and I'm sorry if one day I have to say something that hurts. Well, and I don't, I don't mean in, in terms of spite, but I mean in terms of me having to point something out. Remember, like, I, have to, I have to make an, account, an accounting for that on Judgment Day. And Yah said to Moshe, how long shall I be scorned by these people? How long shall I be not trusted by them with all the signs which I have done in their midst? I mean, how many signs has he done in our individual lives? Every week we have praise reports of how he's done these things and then we continue to not trust him. Let me smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and make you, make you a nation greater and mightier than they. He would have still been true to his promise to Abraham if he'd have done that. Because it's still Abraham's seed inherited in the land. I believe Moshe was actually being tested here. What are you going to do, as we're going to see? And Moshe said to Yah, then the Mitzrites shall hear this. 
For by your power you brought these people up from their midst, and they shall say to the inhabitants of this land, have, they have heard that you, Yah, are in the midst of these people, that you, Yah, are seen eye to eye, and that your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a column of cloud by day, and in a column of fire by night. Now if you shall kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your report shall speak, saying, Because Yah was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. Do you think Yah knew this? That I believe Moshe was being tested here. How humble are you really? Who do you seek more? Your leadership skills? Or do you really are you jealous for my name? He doesn't even really plead for the people. He says, this is about your name, Father. Can we do that? How jealous are we for his name, his authority, his character? And now I pray, let the power of Yah be great, as you have spoken, saying, Yah is patient and of great kindness, forgiving crookedness and transgression, but by no means leaving unpunished, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please forgive the crookedness of this people according to the greatness of your kindness as you have forgiven this people from its thrive even until now. This is a perfect picture of what intercession looks like. The people were ready to kill him. They were picking up stones. Could you intercede for someone that's, I don't know, brandishing a knife at you? You know, can you pray for your enemies and mean it? Not do it out of this sort of, well, I have to pray for my enemies because Yeshua said so. Can you actually do it and mean it? Can we intercede for others even when, when we know they are guilty and are to blame? That's what compassion is, by the way. Compassion is not just being nice. Compassion is when you've been wronged and you're still good to them. That's compassion. You know, Yeshua, forgive them, Father. I know They know not what they do. Can we pray for our enemies? And Yah said, I shall forgive according to your word, but truly as I live and all the earth is filled with the esteem of Yah, for none of these men who have seen my esteem and the signs which I did in Mitzrayim and in the wilderness and have tried me now these ten times and have disobeyed my voice shall see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor any of those who scorned me see it. But my servant Kalev, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me completely, I shall bring into the land where he went and his seed shall inherit it. Caleb had a different spirit and he followed out of him completely, not partially, completely. How do we know that we have his spirit? And we are witnesses to these matters, and so also is the set-apart spirit whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. There's a lot of people out there claiming, I'm spirit-filled, and they do not obey, which is in clear contradiction. Let's keep going. If you don't believe Peter, let's see what Yeshua had to say. Whatever you ask in my name, that I shall do, in order that the Father might be esteemed in the Son. Christianity just stops there. Whatever we ask in his name, he'll do. Let's keep going. If you ask whatever in my name, I shall do it. If you love me, you shall guard my commands. If. It's predicated on that if. And I shall ask the Father and he shall give you another helper to stay with you forever. Having the Spirit is, if you love me, you shall guard my commands. Then I shall ask the Father and he shall give you another helper to stay with you forever. The spirit of the truth. What is the truth? Your word is an everlasting truth. When David said that, the Psalms weren't written and neither was the rest of the Tanakh. He had Torah and the book of Joshua. (laughs) Whom the world is, look, the world is unable to receive because it does not see him or know him. It doesn't have a relation with him. But you know him, for he stays with you and shall be in you. If you stay in me and my word stay in you, you shall ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. If you stay in him, in this my father esteemed, that you bear much fruit and you shall be my taught ones. As the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Stay in my love 
If you guard my commands, you shall stay in my love. So when he says, if you stay in me, he's literally saying, if you guard my commands, you shall stay in my love, even as I have guarded my father's commands and stay in his love. Remember, what did he say? If you guard my commands, then you shall have my spirit. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we guard his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. You can be pleasing to your father in heaven. He can look down on you and go, wow. And actually, that's the real word there of uh, grace, favor. It's this idea of you, you are, you're a gleam in your father's eye. You please him. And this is his command, that we should believe in the name of his son, Yeshua Messiah, and love one another as he gave us command. And the one guarding his command stays in him. So when Yeshua says, stay in me, and he in him, by this we know that he stays in us, by the spirit which he gave us. The spirit is his nature, his essence. How can you say you have his spirit and do everything that he disapproves of. It's the height of hypocrisy. This is the spirit that is actually promised as part of the renewed covenant. In Ezekiel 36 it says, I shall take you from among the Gentiles and I shall gather you out of all the land and shall bring you into your own land and I shall sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols I cleanse you. I'm sorry, we're not there yet. And I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and shall take out the heart of stone out of your flesh and shall give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you and I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and shall do them. Not think about them, not talk, do them. That's what it means to have a new spirit inside of you. And it shall be when all these words come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the Gentiles where Yah your Elohim drives you, and shall turn back, Teshuvah, turn back to Yah your Elohim and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children. Then Yah your Elohim, I believe this is where we're at now. We're starting to turn back to him. Then Yah your Elohim shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you. And he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yah your Elohim has scattered you. And Yah your Elohim shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being so that you might live. And you shall turn back and obey the voice of Yah and do all his commands you which I command you today. Moshe was speaking the Torah that day. For Yah turns back to rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of Yah your Elohim to guard his commands and his laws, which are written in this book of the Torah, if you turn back to Yah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being, let's bring it back home. But my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit and followed me completely with all his heart, with all his strength, with all his might. It was that spirit and that attitude that allowed him to get into the land. And right now, we're in this position where we're all in the wilderness, waiting to go in the land. If types and shadows are cyclical, why does scripture say a remnant? Two people from 3.5 million people on a lower estimate is truly a remnant. When it says, I shall call you one from a clan, two from a family, two from a city. Remnant. Caleb was not afraid of the giants in the land. We must not be afraid of the giants in our land. We too, then having so great a cloud of witnesses all around us, let us lie aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us. There's things that are not necessarily sin as per Torah, but they entangle you. They steer you away. For me, it's playing guitar all day. I can quite happily play my guitar and chase music, and it's, that would distract me from doing this position now. 
It's a weight if I don't keep it in check. And let us run with endurance the race set before us. Look into the princely leader and perfecter of our belief, Yeshua, who for the joy that was set before him endured the stake, having despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of Elohim. For consider him who endured such opposition from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your lives. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So when you say the giants in my land are too much, I can't do this. You've not even faced what they did. What were the first century believers facing? Tortures, persecutions, being thrown into the Colosseum. I mean, Nero used to use the most human torches to have dinner by. We, oh, my boss says I can't have Shabbat. Oh, really? What, what's my parents are going to say? What are all my friends going to say when I, I, I stop eating pork? Or Really? You've not resisted unto blood. Again, the Israelites, they had like great big towering people. They, they had an excuse. We don't have those excuses. And Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon saying, How long shall this evil congregation have this grumbling against me? And I have heard the grumblings with, with, the, with wit, which the children of Israel are grumbling against me. <laughs> Say to them, as I live, declares Yah, as you have spoken in my hearing, so I do to you. The carcasses of who, you who have grumbled against me are going to fall in this wilderness. All of you who were registered according to the entire number from 20 years old and above. None of you except Kalev, son of Yephunneh, and Yehoshua, son of Nun, shall enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Moshe had to hear this, by the way. Only Caleb and Joshua are making it in. And Moshe, is, he's not like freaking out going, but what about me? He quietly submitted. That's, that's, a, that's true humility. Moshe would have cottoned on to this. And you, he didn't freak out and go, well, I'm not doing this anymore. No, he carried on. He carried on. But your little ones, whom you said would become a prey, I shall bring in, and they shall know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your carcasses are going to fall in this wilderness. I mean, this is strong language. And your sons shall be wanderers in the wilderness 40 years and shall bear your whorings until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. This shows us how the sins of the fathers are passed on to the third and fourth generation. That nation, that generation died. Their sons had to remain another 40 years because of mum and dad. And they had to suffer because of that. No doubt these people probably had children then as well. So you've got another generation below that that are suffering because of this generation. Your sin affects other people. The, the classic one is um, when a mar- one of the married couple has an affair. It affects all the children. It affects all the other family members. That have, you've torn apart a unit. You've, it's a form of murder because of one person's sin. According to the number of days in which you have spied out the land, 40 days, a day for a year, a day for a year, you are to bear your crookedness 40 years and you shall know my breaking off. Like breaking off. He turns his face. I am Yah. I have spoken. I shall do this to all this evil congregation who are meeting against me. In the wilderness they are consumed and there they die. To walk against the Father is a fearful place to be. But if you do not obey me and do not do all these commands, and if you reject my laws and your being loathes my right rulings, you can accept them but then loathe them. How, we've talked about this before. What's, is your obedience out of necessity or is it out of love and submission so that you do not do all my commands, but break my covenant, I shall set my face against you, you shall be smitten before your enemies, and those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after this, if you do not obey me, then I shall punish you seven more times for your sins. And if you walk contrary to me and refuse to obey me, I, my, I shall bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins and send wild beasts among you which shall bereave you of your children and I shall cut off your livestock and make you few in number and your highway shall be deserted. And if you are not instructed by me 
by these, but walk contrary to me, then I also walk contrary to you, and I myself shall smite you seven times for your sins. And I shall bring against you a sword executing the vengeance of my covenant. And you shall gather together in your cities, and I shall send pestilence among you, and you shall be given into the hand of your enemy. I mean, this happened for the kingdom of Israel. And remember, everything is cyclical. And I've said this before, why do we have a great tribulation? We think it's for the world, it's not. It's for us. You have the choice to refine yourself now or be refined by a great tribulation. And if in spite of this you do not obey me but walk contrary to me, then I shall walk contrary to you in wrath. And I myself shall punish you seven times for your sin. When I was off in the world doing worldly things for that stint, I had fear. I didn't know why I was afraid. You just have unrest. You can't put a finger on it. And what you do, you drown it out with drugs, alcohol, music, whatever. But there's something missing. Why? Because you're in this space. And you wonder why nothing goes right. Because you're in that space. For I am Yah, I shall not change. He said all these things. What does it say in Hebrews? That these things were written for us. We'll read these in part two. And the men who Moshe sent out to spy the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing an evil report of the land. See, it was because of the ten spies that the rest of the congregation fell. Again, your sin, your lack of faith, your lack of trust and obedience can affect other people. This is why it's paramount for leadership to have their walk together. Because if the leaders are not walking the walk, well then it, this, this radiates out. Even those men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before Yah. People died instantly. The problem is we don't get our, our, our judgments instantly on the spot. Therefore we think, ah, well, I'm okay. I, I've escaped it this time. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Yehoshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Yephunah remained alive. And when Moshe spoke these words to all the children of Yisrael, the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning, went to the top of the mountain, saying, See, we have indeed sinned, but we shall go up to the place which Yah had spoken of. Too little, too late, huh? But Moshe said, Why do you now transgress the command of Yah, since it does not prosper? Do not go up, lest you be smitten by your enemies, for Yah is in your midst. I mean, for Yah is not in your midst, sorry. I mean, we do this, we, we, we've... You, you see it with children and parents. The child does something and the parent brings, you know, the wrath, the punishment. And the kids, oh, listen now, oh, listen now. It's too late. Please don't ground me. I, I, I promise I'll behave. You're going to be grounded. I'm sorry. Because the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you and you shall fall by the sword because you have turned away from Yah. Yah is not with you. But they presume to go up to the mountaintop, but neither the Ark of the Covenant nor Moshe left the camp. So the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and smote them and beat them down even to Hormah. It's interesting that when you don't have the symbol of his covenant, the Ark, and the Torah, you will be vanquished. They didn't have the Ark and Moshe. What's the sign of our covenant? The signs of the covenant, the Shabbats. These are a sign. If you don't have the sign of that covenant and Moshe, you will be vanquished. See to it that no one falls short of the favour of Elohim, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, by which many become defiled. We've done this bitter root thing before, idolatry. Walking in sin and claiming it's okay, I'm blessed by which many become defiled, lest there should be anyone who whores or profane one like Esau, who for a single meal sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wished to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Too little, too late. A good analogy of this is the commandment of honour your father and your mother. Let's just say you've spent your whole life just being awful to them, not honouring them, tearing them down, rejecting their authority, and then they die. 
Do you now have a chance to repent of that sin? No. Think about that. Because one day the opportunity, you think, oh, I'll repent later. You, th- those parents die, that's it. The child can't make up for it. They can try by, I don't know, submitting to spiritual fathers and mothers, but do you see the point I'm trying to get at? Eventually, you're going to run out of chances. I know, look, part one's difficult. Well, it'll kind of lighten up a bit next part. But let's take a break and, yeah, mull on these things. Right, uh, part one was pretty heavy. Um, so let's, it gets a bit lighter. Let's look at part two. There is always hope, always hope. A good and loving parent will always follow discipline with love and reinsurance. So what did we have in part one? We got to the end and Yah says, that's it. You're all, time out, all right? It, obviously it was a lot more than just that, but you, this generation will die in the wilderness. That's my punishment and I'm not budging. A good, good parent will follow that with love and reassurance. You know, for me, I'd get the smack. And my mum would say, Michael, I still love you. Ne- never did, you know, I, it didn't feel like that at the time. You don't love me, you hit me. But she would always follow it with love and reassurance. And says, I had to do that because X, Y, and Z. Elohim did the same with the children of Israel. After the events we have covered, so we've, we covered... Um, Exodus 13 and 14. This is what we read next, the very next chapter. And Yah spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have come into the land of your dwellings, which I am giving you, and you make an offering to fire by Yah. After telling them that a whole generation would die in the wilderness, he gave them hope. He says, you guys, that's it. But then straight after that, the very next thing, he tells them, When you enter into the land... He's given them that hope that, look, yes, you're on the naughty step now, so to speak, but you will go into the land. I will be faithful. I love you. He reminded them that his punishment will not last forever and that he will still keep his promise of giving the land to the seed of Abraham. Again, we, and Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I bring you, then it shall be when you eat of the bread of that land that you present a contribution to Yah. Not only is he saying they're going to be in the land, but he says you're going to have enough to give contribution. While the parents had blown it, the children were still given a chance. You know, the generation in the wilderness. That would, it would have been of comfort to the parents. Okay, yes, we're not going to go in, but at least my children will go in. After discipline usually comes a reminder of the house rules, right? Your parents will deal with you, they'll re- reassure you, we still love you, but this, these are the ground rules. Yah does the same thing. And when you sin by mistake and do not do all these commands, which Yah has spoken to Moshe, all that Yah has commanded you by the hand of Moshe from the day Yah gave command and onward throughout your generations, then it shall be, if it is done by mistake, without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall prepare one young bull as a burnt offering, as a sweet fragrance to Yah, with its grain offering and its drink offering, according to the right ruling, and one male goat as a sin offering. The priest shall then make atonement for the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was done by mistake. And they shall bring their offering and an offering made by fire to Yah and their sin offering before Yah for their mistake. I mean, think of it, the teenager gets grounded uh, for staying out too late and they get disciplined and says, look, you're grounded. Let's remind you, when the child is no longer grounded, what what does a parent usually do? Now, remember what I told you. Remember, these are the rules. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger who sojourns in their midst because all the people did it by mistake. And if a being sins by mistake, then he shall bring a female goat a year old as a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for the being who strays by mistake when he sins by mistake before Yah to make atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. For him who does whatever by mistake, there is one Torah 
both for him who is native among the children of Israel and that's meant to say for the stranger who sojourns in his midst or something like that. But the, now listen, but the being who does whatever defiantly, the Hebrew there says with a high hand, whether he is native or stranger, he reviles Yah, and that being shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of Yah and has broken his command, that being shall certainly be cut off, his crookedness is upon him. Again, bring it back to the parent analogy. You've been, the child has been grounded, they've now been allowed back out, and the parent says, if you do this again, whoa, right? It's going to come back. If you mess up again, I'm not going to be as favorable. It's upon you. You're, you know, it's on your head. You're doing it defiantly, though you know better. These laws apply to everyone under the banner of Israel. And when a stranger sojourns with you, now we've done this before, this is the gear. The gear was the, per, the stranger coming in to become part of Israel. This was Ruth the Moabitess, essentially. This is, it's not just a stranger that wants to live his worldly lifestyle in the, in the camp. This is the gear, the one who's becoming with you, or whoever is among you throughout your generations and would make an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yah, as you do, so he does. One law is for you of the assembly and for the stranger who sojourns with you. They have to sojourn with you. There's this, this idea of you're, you're doing what we do. You're walking along this path with us. A law forever throughout your generations. As you are, so is the stranger before we are. This is, I say this because when we're new to this walk and we're zealous for his Torah, which is good, we inflict that upon other people. You must do this too. You must, when they've not had the revelation. This is for those that are under the banner of Israel. Now, if that person wants to come in and see how things are done around here, then they, they will have to you know, do as we do which is fair enough. But you can't, you can't inflict Torah upon a non-believer. They're going to go, what are you talking about? Now, they're on their own journey. That's in Yah's hands. One Torah and one right ruling is for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you. Those that call themselves of Messiah, that say they are the seed of Abraham, this applies to all of them. Okay, who knows what we're going to talk about now? Mm -hmm. We know this story. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moshe and to Aharon and to all the congregation. And they put him under guard because it had not been declared what should be done to him. And Yah said to Moshe, the man shall certainly be put to death, all the congregation stoning him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones as Yah commanded Moshe and he died. Just as an interesting aside, the ancient sages used to teach that after the, all these events, because the, when you've just been disciplined, you have a renewed zeal to keep the Torah of the house, so to speak. So this is why it says the people found the person. So they knew they'd been in trouble, so they're going to do the best. It's, it's interesting, just as an aside. Without the context of the preceding chapters, this story makes Elohim and Israel look like tyrants, right? We've just spent all of part one going through what really happened. This story is in context of all of that. Rebellion. Thumb in their nose in, at the Creator. However, this story is the equivalent of a hardened criminal reoffending as soon as he comes out of jail. You read these things, you know, serial rapist locked up for so long and they let him off for a bit and within one week he's at it again. This is the equivalent of that. It's not just, oh, I was just picking up sticks. Woo. This is a reoffending. This is They've just been disciplined. They've just been told you're going to lose a whole generation of people. And he's like, you know what? Whatever. The rest of the world conjures up images like this when this story... You'll see atheists will use this story to discredit Torah, to discredit Yah. People come up with images like this. Oh, just a peaceful man gathering a few sticks, you know. 
Look at this lovely nature walk. Why would you do that? Oh, the poor little boy. You mean, you mean to tell me you're going to stone the boy? How dare you? However, this is actually what was re- really going on. Something like this. Like that. Gathering sticks. It wasn't just, you know, if you want to go on a nature walk on Shabbat and you want to have your walking stick, men like having a stick, you're not breaking Shabbat. This is what it's, it's talking about. Gathering lots of sticks. Does that look like work? Hard labor? I probably couldn't even pick up that many sticks. <laughs> the man was gathering sticks that, had, that was gathering, was, had the intention of working. The, the, when, when, you know when on the, uh, it says, you shall not make a fire? The fires were used for work, smelting and stuff like that. But also making a fire. Back then, you didn't have lighters. You didn't have lighter fuel. It, you had to gather the wood. I mean, you have to do what that guy does, carry all that stuff. Then you, It was hard work. You were allowed to keep a fire lit, though, if it had already been lit. If you didn't have your fire lit on Shabbat, you froze to death in the wilderness. It got cold. You needed warmth. But you had to prepare for it. He pretty much thought, I'm going to die in this wilderness anyway. I may as well do what I want. He was told, you're going to die. Well, what's the point? There's no hope. Not thinking that there is always hope with Elohim. There is always an opportunity to repent. If you truly mean it. If you truly mean it. After everything that had happened... He decided to willingly trample the sign of the covenant as if it was nothing. It wasn't so much about the gathering of sticks. It's that he took the sign of the covenant and he stamped on it. In in light of all the events that had happened. This is why he was executed. Had he not been executed, the result would have been lawlessness on a national level. Oh, well, this guy can do that. Well, I can do this. We're, we're all going to die anyway here. What's the point? That would, it's infectious. This is why we, when sin occurs in the camp, because it's going to happen, we have to deal with it in, in the righteous, proper manner. Not let it just kind of, because it spreads. Not because it's like some disease that's contagious, but it's this thing, well, if he can do that, my sin's not as bad as his, so it will go unnoticed. And before you know it, it's, that's how it spreads. Influence. This is why he had to be executed. Let this be a warning to those that know the truth yet do not heed. This guy knew better. Though, you know, he was like, you know what, I don't even care anymore. That this is what it means to sin with a high hand, to sin defiantly. It's actually only in light of these events in Numbers that we can fully understand these passages. These are the passages that put the fear of Yah in us. For if after they had escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of the Master and Saviour, Yeshua Messiah, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than at the first. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the set-apart command delivered unto them. For them, the proverb has proved true, a dog returns to his own vomit and a washed sow returns to her rolling in the mud. This guy knew the truth. He'd seen all the signs. He saw the, the, you know, the, the ten plagues and the fire and all the miracles. And then he, you know, he saw the decree. He would have seen Moshe coming out with the face glowing. And then he went, you know what? I don't care. That's what that means. For if we sin purposely after we have received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a slaughter or sacrifice for sins, but some fearsome anticipation of judgment and a fierce fire which is about to consume the opponents. Anyone who has disregarded the Torah of Moshe dies without compassion on the witness of of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common and insulted the spirit of favour or grace? These are scary verses. And I'm not trying to take away the Peshat understanding. We know better. We do know better. 
But struggling and sinning defiantly are two different things. For we know him who has said, vengeance is mine, I shall repay, said Yah. And again, Yah shall judge his people. It is fearsome to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. This guy picking up sticks, he knew. He had no excuse. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the set-apart spirit and have tasted the good word of Elohim and the powers of the age to come, And fall away to renew them again to repentance, having impaled for themselves the son of Elohim again and put him to open shame. This people that backslide, they read this and they think, that's it, I'm doomed. I've I've tasted the heavenly gift. Again, what was the man gathering sticks on Shabbat doing? It's in that context. Now, obviously, this should still be a warning to us. This... When I grew up, I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist. And I went off into the world. And then I came to this walk. Those, I'm going to argue that those in mainstream Christianity have not truly tasted the gift. The full truth. They, they, know, they, they do know better. They have a higher accountability. But do you know the fullness of him? Or do, you, do you know this is what, did you have a deep, intimate relationship? Now that I'm on this walk, though, I now can't walk away. Not only have I been, you know, took the back, you know, the immersion of water, I've literally cut the covenant, I've signed the dotted line that saying this is it for life. I now don't have any excuse to walk away from this. Then I fall under this. I just see this misused. Yes, it's a warning. And it should be a warning, but let's not, let's not condemn people with it, is what I'm trying to say. For ground that is drinking the rain off and falling on it, and is bearing plants fit for those by whom it is tilled, receives blessings from Elohim. But if it brings forth thorns and thistles, it is rejected and near to being cursed, and ends up being burnt. What did the children of Israel do? Ten times these people have tried me. They drank the water of the word often and they just bore fruits of rebellion and distrust. This is what this is talking about. On a different angle, it also speaks to those that listen and want help but do nothing about it. You see people that, you know, the prophet Ezekiel, Yah said to him, the people want to listen to your words and they say, come, let's hear the word of Yah. But then they don't do it. You know, people that play church, riding on the coattails of other people, that it's more of a social club. Are you drinking the rain often and not producing fruit? There's people out there that they say they want help, but they don't take it. They they don't act upon it. They're drinking rain often and bringing up thorns and thistles. You know, Yeshua, he never forced anyone to follow him. He gave his water out and he says, come, take it or leave it. I'm moving forward. Those that are not willing to put in the work in to help themselves. It's one thing saying, I've messed up again. I'm a sinner and I can't do this. But there's, again, are you sinning with a high hand? Are you willing to till the ground of your heart? No matter how hard. Are you willing to face those giants of sin in your life? Or you're going to be like the man and go, you know what, who cares? I'm going to die anyway. I'm a sinner anyway. Let's hope for the best. Are people with me so far? All right. Let's look at this. Zeep, zeep. And Yah spoke to Moshe. So everything that's just happened now leads us to this. And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Yisrael, and you shall say to them to make Zitzio. So this is after the incident of the man and the sticks. After. Context. Speak to the children of Yisrael and say to them to make Zitzio on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, throughout, and to put a blue cord in the tzitzi of the corners. And it shall be to you for a tzitzi, and you shall see it, and shall remember all the commands of Yah, and shall do them, and not search after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you went whoring. 
so that you remember and shall do all my commands and be set apart unto your Elohim. I love how that you remember, you do, and the doing sets you apart. It's not this like magical, I'm imbued with holiness. You do it. And the more you walk, the closer you get to him, the more and more set apart you become. Obviously, this is through his spirit, but I hope you hear what I'm saying. After this incident of the man picking up sticks, he goes, you know what? You guys need a visual reminder. You need to see it. It's actually an act of mercy, what he's doing there. You know what? I know you guys don't get it. I'm going to give you something to help you remember. I am Yah your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim. I am Yah your Elohim. It is because of everything that we've covered today that Elohim gave us this command. That's why. Because we rebel, we don't listen, we distrust. And when he, tells, when he gives us a stern talking to and says, this is how it is, we then go, you know what, what's the point? It's meant to be a constant reminder. You know, you know the, in, uh, they used to tie a string around their finger to remind them of this is the first one. Every time we look at our CTO, we should remember all the events that we've covered so far today and, and this application to us in our lives. Do not, this is the parallel passage. Do not put on a garment of different kinds of wool and linen together. Make tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. From what we've read, CTO is to have a blue thread running through them and there are to be four of them. That's what we know. It says to have a blue thread running through it and to have four of them for the four corners. They are not to be made of wool and linen. I say this because in some of the messianic circles, and even some of the Jewish circles actually, they will say that the priestly garment, the high priest, was the only person that wore wool and linen together. And by the tzitzit being made of wool and linen, you are a priest unto Yah, and it was a reminder that you're part of the priestly, on and on and on. Do, it's pretty straightforward. Do not mix wood and linen, then make zizi. It doesn't say, ah, oh, but. Except for the zizi. It's very clear. And people will say, oh, well, they found zizi made with wool and linen that date from the second century. That doesn't mean they were doing it right. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Just because it happened in ancient times doesn't mean it was right. I mean, the Pharisees were ancient and they had their baggage. So they're not to be made of wool and linen. And I don't care how you want to twist it. And it's very clear. It shall be for a seat and you shall see it. I say this because it is to be seen by others as well. People say, it says that it shall be, when you look at your seat, how often, people that wear them, how often do you see your own seat seat? When you put them on, but what about during the day? No. no. Now, if everybody is wearing them, now do you see them? Every Shabbat, I look at a room and I see them everywhere. The reminder is not for you, just for you. It's for everyone else. If everyone was wearing them, everyone would see and go, ah, the covenant is to be seen by others. They are not to be so small that you, you, know, you need your mind. Get your magnifying glass out and look at my zizi. They're to be seen. It's quite clear. And you shall see it. The only reason people have small TTO or wear them hidden, this is another thing, they hide them, is because they are ashamed and fear ridicule and embarrassment. I'm sorry, it's, let's be honest. And I know this because, guess what, I speak from experience. When I was first convicted of this command, I was at my last year of university. And this is the, the hypocrisy I was walking in, that I would wear them at home, but I didn't want to wear them at uni. What's everyone else going to say? They're going to think I'm weird. And that didn't last long. About a week. On the second week, I, I couldn't take it. The conviction was so hard. You are a hypocrite. Why are you ashamed? Are you embarrassed? Do you follow me? Do you love me? I'm sorry. It, it's just the truth of the matter. Are you ashamed of the Father's commandments? That's, let, let, let's be straight. Are you ashamed? A lot of people write that they fight against this command. This is due, to, again, I've said this is due to fear and embarrassment at the core, at the core. In essence, this is to be ashamed of the Father's commands. 
Now, people will cover this up with various re They'll reason it away as to why they don't have to wear them. They reason it away. Let's look at this. It's for the Jews. That's the common one, you know, from Christianity. That's for the Jews, and we're not the Jews. Da, 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 da. Uh, we're beyond that. Times have changed. Fashion has changed. Is it a fashion statement? Well, they, they, is it a fashion statement? Secondly, what did we read? I am Yah, I do not change. Our garments don't have four corners. Nowhere does it say, wear tzitzit, but if you don't have four corners, don't worry about it. He only says on the four corners because at the time they had four corners. Is it about having, is the commandment of tzitzit about having four corners on your garment or is it about wearing them? It's about wearing them. Not, you must have four cornered garments. Now, some of the Jewish circles, they've developed garments with four corners, like a talikatan. So, like, it's basically a flap you wear underneath and you hang your tzitzit off it. You know, it's not about having four corners. It's about wearing them. What's the, what's the point of wearing them again? Remember, the context of everything is so that you see them, to remember the commands, to do them, to do them. This is, oh, this is the kicker. I, I don't need to be reminded of the Torah because it is written on my heart. <laughs> the very fact people say that shows it's not written on their heart. The very fact that they say that, it shows it's not. Why do I say this? Because we read this. I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I shall give you a heart of flesh. And I shall put my spirit within you, and I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my... And do them. If you have a spirit, you're doing them. I don't need to do it because it is, <laughs> it's like saying... I. I don't need to keep the Torah of mine and Ruth's marriage because it's written on my heart. It's written on my heart so I can do what I want. I love you. And then, it, it just, we don't do it to each other, so why do we do it to him? That's the main reason I see it. It's written on my heart, I don't need to do it. Okay, the Sabbath is written on my heart, I don't need to go to Shabbat. It doesn't make sense. I'm not a Pharisee. That's the other one they use. I'm not a Pharisee. And they quote this. Uh, when Yeshua is really you know, scolding the Pharisees and they do all their works to be seen by men, they make their tefillin, you know, the black things with the prayer things, and lengthen the tzitzio of their garments. The problem is not the wearing of tzitzio, it's the wearing them for show and self-exaltation and self-righteousness, right? He's not saying, and they wear tzitzio, they lengthen it. If you read the whole context, it's about them. Be, they love to be called rabbi and they love to sit in the greatest seats and they love to be adored by men and they pray on the corners for everyone to see. This is what this is about. You'll see messianics do this when they wear ropes for ZZ. So obviously, you know, don't wear them too small, but don't make it a show either. What, what's the, why are you wearing them? This is why CTO are not to become fashion accessories. I say this because people now start putting crystals and look at my crystal tzitzi and like, look, we have, Sean, you wear uh, red, blue and purple. They're the colours of the tabernacle. That's cool. Do, do you see what I mean? He's not doing it because it, it, it's a fashion statement. You're doing it, it's a tabernacle thing. You know, I've got some gold in there. We're supposed to be gold. Your word is... The command, just don't make it a fashion statement, is what I'm saying. If you want to wear it, fine, just have the blue thread, but do you see what I'm trying to say? Because if not, you're actually doing what the Pharisees did. They're not to be fashion accessories. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm going to tread on some toes now. So, Almost all Jewish people and most messianic say that only the men are to wear tzitzit. You've probably heard this. Only the men are to wear tzitzit. Let's look at that. They say this because of this. Speak to the children of Yisrael and you shall say to make tzitzit and stuff. The phrase used is actually B'nai Yisrael, which means sons of Israel. So they say this is given to the sons of Israel. Therefore, women, you don't have to wear the tzitzit because it's given to the sons. Let's look at this. By this logic, women are not subject to the rest of the Torah. 
If you're going to use equal weights and measures, which is a biblical principle, equal weights and measures, if you say in that instance it's only for the men, then throughout the whole Torah it's written to just the men. This, this is how ludicrous it gets. Let's go through it. Let's follow it through. In Exodus 31, and Yah spoke to Moshe, and you speak okay, to the sons of Israel, because that's what it says, saying, my Sabbaths you are to guard by all means. It is a sign between me and you and, th- and you throughout your generations to know that I, Yah, what? So it's just for the men, yeah? The Sabbath, just, ladies, you're free to go. <laughs> right? Do, do you see what I'm trying to get at? And you shall guard the Sabbath. It is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall certainly be put to death and so forth. Six days work is done and on the seventh is a Sabbath of rest set apart to Yah. And the children of Israel shall guard the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath. Only the men are to do it. By, by this logic, only the men. Can you see? The, it, it, it just doesn't hold up to what It doesn't hold. Between me and the children of Israel, it is a sign. Sorry, ladies, apparently Yah forgot you. He, the sign's just, really? Really? Are women now excluded from this? Or is it the understanding of men that has twisted this? Let's look at another one. By the way, every time you see and say this to the children, it says, B'nai Yisrael, every single time. So when Edom refused to let Yisrael pass over through his border, Yisrael turned away from him. And the children of Yisrael, all the company, departed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. Apparently the women got left behind. Every time the children of Israel got up and moved, the women got left behind, because it's only to the sons of Israel. Do, do you see the, the fallacy, the logical fallacy? Were the women left behind? No, of course they were. It's an idiom. It is quite clear that the phrase B'nai Yisrael applies to the whole kingdom. The whole kingdom. Okay, we think of the children of Israel as a nation, whereas there are in fact the descendants of Yaakov. This is what it means. The sons of Israel. Who was Israel? <laughs> Jacob. Rakov, right? You are the descendants of Jacob. This is to the descendants of, which we, by the way, we're grafted into now. When it says the sons of, it's the descendants of. This is another reason. Uh, some Jews will say that zizi are actually uh, man's attire. So they'll say a man shall not pertain to that of a woman and so forth. Please find me a book, chapter and verse on that. Again, going through what we've just read through about the children of Israel, the B'nai Yisrael, it, it, it doesn't hold water. Again, the phrase B'nai Yisrael applies to the whole nation. How, how, were the, how was the information dissem- disseminated, by the way? Moshe would speak to the leaders. The leaders would then, you know, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, fifty, so forth. It would have been given to the, essentially, the heads of households, which would have been, you know, like the father of the house. Did that now just stay there? No, it went to the whole family. It's just how information was disseminated. The notion that only men are to wear CCO is a man-made command. That's, let, let's call it out for what it is. This is a perfect example of how we nullify the commands of Elohim with our traditions. You know when Yeshua says, well, do you nullify... Um, he uses the analogy of... The Torah says you need to honour your father and mother, but you say, whatever, is, whatever I've received from you is a gift of the temple... Therefore, what was happening is that the children were taking their inheritance and giving it to the temple, and the Pharisees said, you now don't have to use that to look after your parents. By their tradition, they nullified the command of Elohim. This is what's gone on here. Can you see what I'm trying to say? Because we say, oh, well, it's just for the men, we've actually nullified that command. Before you say, ah, what does it even matter? They're just tassels. They're just tassels. If they're just tassels, wear them. They're just tassels, right? It's no big deal. They're just tassels. Wear them then. (laughs) I'm sorry. I had to go there. 
You will soon find wearing them, it brings something out of you you didn't know was there, and that's fear and ashamedness. That's the whole point of it. That's what it brought out of me. I hold my hand up. I speak from experience. I didn't want to wear them all the time. What are people going to think? Da, 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 da. And most of you will vouch for this. Hardly anyone says anything. In the years I've been wearing them, I think I've been asked about three, four tops. Why are we embarrassed of these things? He's asked us to... It's, it's the equivalent of being ashamed of turning up to Shabbat. Quick, let's go to Shabbat in secret. It's ridiculous. Equal weights and measures, right? You'll be, you'll be amazed at that, how far-reaching that command is. Equal weights and measures. It shall, let, let, let's give a nice little insight on this. The reason for them is so that you do not search after your own heart and your own eyes, right? That's the reason for them. That this is another thing I will say. People, oh, well, it's written on my heart. If it's written on your heart, you wouldn't be searching after your own eyes. Well, guess what we're still doing? Searching after, our, therefore we need the reminder. This word appears in a very interesting place. This not search. We covered it today. And they gave the children of Israel an evil report of the land which they had spied out. It's the same word. This word appears, the most times it's used is in that story we've just covered of the 12 spies. They searched the land out and in the process they slandered Elohim. The zitzi is to prevent us from doing that. This is, they're just hassles. No, this is, it's for your own benefit. Again, why was the wearing of CTO commanded? Because we're not there, I'm afraid. We're still fallen and we need reminders. Sometimes we need a kick up the backside. I'm sorry, I still need reminders. I'm not holy. I'm not in the sense of, I'm not, I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. Most of you know the messianic connections, but it's worth re reminding ourselves. For look, this is a prophecy, the day shall come burning like a furnace and all the proud and every wrongdoer shall be stubble and the day that shall come shall burn them up. And Yah, of, says Yah of hosts, which leaves them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. The word for wings is kanaf. If you go to Deuteronomy 22, where it says you shall make four, uh, tassels on the four corners, is the same word, kanaf. It can mean outer, extremity, edge, wing. And you shall go out and leap for joy like calves from the stool. And you shall trample the wrongdoers, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, said Yah of hosts. Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Yisrael, laws and right rulings. This is, he's telling the people in the end generation when the day of Yah is going to come. Remember the Torah. One of which is this. See, I am sending you Eliyah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. I just wanted to point this out because he's saying this to the last generation. Remember these, the Torah. Let's link this now to Yeshua. And a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who having spent all her livelihood on physicians, was unable to be healed by any came from behind him and touched the tzitzit of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. The Greek here is hem. It means the hem of a garment. You lose it in translation, but if a, you said to a Hebrew, the hem of the garment, they knew what it meant. When David cut the edge of Saul's garment, he cut the tzitzit off. It was a symbol of the, what a person's authority, the, gar, the hem of the garment. And the richer people would have more ornate hems, and David, why did David feel so bad by doing what he did? It's because it was the symbol it portrayed. This is why Saul knew he's going to be the next king. And wherever he went, into the villages or cities or the country, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and begged him to let them touch, if only the tzitzit of his garment, and as many as touched him were healed. Thus fulfilling the prophecy, he shall come with healing in his wings and you shall leap like calves out of a stool. 
What happened to the lame man who Yeshua healed? He leapt for joy. Okay, let's change things. Do you act like a pagan? And by a pagan, I mean someone out of covenant. If you do, don't wear them. Do you sound like a pagan? Do you sound like a worldly person? When people listen to you talk, are you talking like they do? Is your mouth full of, like, the obvious one, swearing, crass jokes? If you sound like that, don't wear them. Do you look like a pagan? And I mean physically and when someone looks into your life. When they stand back and look, this is the life of person A, do they look at you and go, well, you look like everybody else? I know, I know people that are more successful than you. And you claim to be a child of the living Elohim. Do you look? Does your, is your life like a pagan? Don't wear them. Are you even ready to wear tzitzit? I say this to, I said it to a couple of people in this congregation. Are you ready to wear them? And I say this because others are watching you. You claim, oh, you claim to be a child of the living Elohim, do you? Let's see what that looks like. You know, it, I see too often people coming new to the faith and like they, they do these easy ones like, you know, keep Shabbat and uh, wear Zizi. These are the more like instant ones that happen. But then they leave the rest of it. And again, they, they, with, if you didn't... If you weren't wearing your zizi, would people still be able to tell you apart from the rest of the world? That's the question I'm trying to say. Because if they can't, what's the point of you even wearing them? Right? Because you bear his name. You're supposed to be an envoy of the king. Right? We, we've been sent out with his name. We bear his name. You know, we've got, hopefully we've got his seal on our forehead and in our right hand, Right? People are watching you. They're not, you don't even know they're watching, but they are. Everyone is watching you. You know, so when, this is what I say to people that come into the faith. Like, you come in with zeal and excitement. I'm like, just be careful before you start saying, you know, like, oh, I've discovered this and I've discovered that. And because you can actually bring his name into disrepute. Because you're wearing the engagement ring. I wear a wedding ring which is the symbol of my union with my wife. She wears a wedding ring and engagement ring. It's a, it's a symbol to everybody else that we are exclusive to one another, right? What does this do? It's the visual representation of the covenant you're in, right? Are we not betrothed to Yeshua? We're betrothed to him, the consummation of which happens when he comes back, right? The ma wedding, marriage, supper of the Lamb. This is an it's, it's like an engagement ring. It's a symbol of who you belong to. Again, are you ready to wear them? Do you, is, does your life show that? Because if not, people see hypocrisy, Elohim, and then the two come to, do you see what I'm trying to get at? Where do we wear TTO? Where do we wear them? What was the command? Where do you wear them? Four corners. Four corners. What do the four corners represent? Four corners of the world. Four corners of the earth. What does the blue represent? Torah. Commandments. That's why there was a blue covering over the ark, right? ZTO is a symbolic emblem of Elohim's sovereignty over all the earth and how his rule, his Torah, his word is going to all four corners. It's just a symbol of that. For the word of Yah is straight and all his works are in truth. Loving righteousness and right ruling, the earth is filled with the kindness of Yah. If you look at the word kindness, it's, um, you'll find it's linked to covenant his covenant of kindness or loving commitment. According to your name, O Elohim, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. 
In the year that sovereign Uzziah died, I saw Yah sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the Heichal, the temple. Sorry, yeah, it is Isaiah 6, thank you. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And they cried one to another, saying, set apart, set apart, set apart is Yah of hosts. All the earth is filled with his esteem to the four corners. And Yah shall be sovereign over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Yah and his name one over all the earth. I hope today's been a blessing and an encouragement and almost that you know a clip round the ear hole. We all need these things. Yeah, I just let's do. Let's, you know, as James says, let's not be hearers only, but doers of the word. 